So the last time we were here, we were starting to uh, work with forms. We're going to continue with the same project as last time. So either if you've got it on your USB, we will use it, or if you don't, we can take it from the network folder. So just to remind you, in the web design folder on the desktop, in the CIS152 folder, uh, 613 was the last time we had the lecture, so you want to copy that folder. If you don't have a copy of your files, uh, you're going to copy that. Don't just edit it in that folder because it's unlocked and everyone's work will be changed. So uh, get a copy of 613. Inside of the folder 613, we've got a picture, we've got a template file, and something we were working on called June 13. I'm going to change the date of that file to June 19th. And even though we don't celebrate it in California today, it's Juneteenth, an interesting holiday uh, historically that you should look into if you don't know about it. The, June, uh, the 19th of June is Juneteenth. So uh, let's go ahead and open up the uh, file. You can right click it and edit with Notepad. There's our project. Uh, it's been a little while since we looked at it, so I'm going to um, run it in the browser to remind myself what it looks like. So this is an example why notes are very useful in your project. We haven't worked on this perhaps for a little bit, and uh, we may forget well, what was it all about. So added, having our, our notes in our project are also for reminders and such of the project. So it was this cookie paradise. Uh, we had a bunch of recipes, uh, links, and we were working at the very end, the contact us section. All we've got is name, and email inputs. Well, um, we'll get back to the section of code where that happened. It's at the very end, at about line 110. So let's see. We're, we're asking for the person's name and email. If they're going to contact us, what else should we be asking for? Feedback. The feedback, the actual text. So we're going to create uh, what is known as a text area, a little block where people can write more than one sentence. So give yourself a new line, 116, 115 was the input for the email. And notice how it worked previously. We need a label and then we need some sort of form element. So let's go ahead and start the label tag. I'm going to close. As I said, I like to close and open the tags first. I know I've got a lot of detail to fill in, but if I don't have autocomplete, I would close, open and close the tags. Between the tags, this is going to be message or uh, feedback. What is it that they want to say? This needs a for attribute. This label is going to be used for something, some other item. In this case, input feedback.
So this label is being used for an input element that we're going to call eventually input feedback. After that, I'll add a space and we'll use the input tag, which has a variety of attributes in order for it to work. Uh, oh, sorry, not this one. Usually we're using input. This is a special one uh, because it's a text area, so it's got its own specific tag. This is the odd thing. Uh, who, when they were inventing these tags, input, they used input over and over and over. For some reason, they use text area differently. So I was about to forget that it's a different tag. It's text area. And it has an opening and closing tag. It has an opening and closing tag. We'll give it a name. It needs the name of input feedback, which is what our label is. So that, of course, means this label is being used for that input field. Go ahead and save it and run it. If you run that, you'll see now a larger text area. This is a spot for email, name, feedback. I'm just putting gibberish. But uh, it turned red on the email because I didn't put in a valid email because of our basic validation feedback little box there I can write a whole bunch and then there's go which doesn't do anything yet but you should see a pop of this is please enter an email address that's happening because on the previous line we've got an input of type email there's some basic built-in validation that will only accept emails so to give people hints of what they should write in these inputs, we actually have the ability to add placeholder text. Each of these inputs can have a placeholder attribute where we can tell people, you should type this. So let's back up line 112, where we've got our input of type text. We've got a type, we've got a name. Let's add another attribute names and classes and IDs when we get to those later I like to add those as the very last attribute most attributes do not matter in the order that you put them in but I like to put names IDs and classes as the last attribute so I can quickly find it when I'm writing the code and I often have to change those attributes so if I have them at the end of a little statement I can find it faster so that means before name let's add placeholder attribute and there I can tell people what should you write here so the words that are in here will appear uh, on screen It's a placeholder attribute. That's what appears before a person types anything here. The usefulness of that is that if you're creating some sort of login system, uh, you can guide people what you should type here. People won't know, OK, name. Do I, own, do I do first name, last name, or do I do last name first? This is the place where I can put last name, comma, first name to guide people. Please put your name in that way, last name, comma, first name. You get the idea then with email and with feedback. So we'll do the same thing with email. Before the name attribute, I'll add a placeholder. 
I like to keep name as the last one. So just uh, any kind of valid email. This again is to tell people you should type an email address here. And we have the validation system that will catch that if they don't type an email, but we should also guide them. I sort of don't recommend to put anything placeholder on feedback. I don't know how really I would guide people to write something there. Um, you know, giving myself a little spot that says, you know, thank you or, or help or something. But uh, I, I'm not going to put anything under feedback. It's the exact same thing. Under the text area tag, I would add placeholder and I would put placeholder text in the feedback box. Now the book does mention on page 154 that you can uh, style the text area a little bit with a few extra attributes of columns and rows. I didn't specify any columns, so the length of it, right, those are columns, the length of it is X amount of width, depending on the browser. And then we've got uh, rows, well, we'll see one, two, three, four rows where they can type something. They're not constrained. A person can add as many rows of information as they want. Here's three, here's four, here's five. So we could specify rows and columns. But again, depending on the browser, look at this. I can stretch that out. I can grab the corner and stretch it out. So it doesn't even matter to a lot of degree how big the, how I specify the box in the code is an accessible field. People can change it how they want. But just make a note, if you need to do columns or rows, page 154 tells you how, and then again it also says check out CSS to style it even better. So, let's say this contact form was about sending us a message, but let's say we've got another part of it where it's like requesting a recipe. Maybe they're going to contact us to ask for a specific recipe that's not on the site. So we'll create some more form fields here. Uh, we'll do um, something known as radio buttons also to select, sort of like yes or no. At the end of this text area, let's add a break. You might have noticed that the go button was to the right side of the text area. We need to break that to push it down. And next we'll create another input field element. Page 155, radio buttons. Okay, so the way this works is uh, we have the actual element and the label, but we'll start with the element first, input, type radio, name, we'll call this... Um, Recipe ask. Value, yes. We'll say yes. Break. exactly the same on the next line. This is for the ability to ask, 
uh, we're going to ask the person, would you like a book of our recipes? Yes or no? That's what I'm trying to set up, having them select yes or no. So I will select that line and paste itself and then change it to no and the value to no. This one is interesting because they often have two or more elements together. Both of them are radio buttons. Both of them have the same name. They're the same sort of group. They each have a value, yes or no. If a person selects this one, it's yes. If a person selects that one, it's no. We can have different things to choose here, like uh, gender or, um, let's say, asking someone to choose their favorite uh, color, and we've got different values of color, but the radio button only allows one possible selection. We'll look at a different one in a moment, checkbox, which, let, which lets you select multiple options. It's not quite fully set up yet, but if you run it, you'll see simply yes or no. We haven't said what are we asking, yes or no, but now here we have if you click yes, if you click no. You see, you can only select one of the two. And that works because both of these radios have the same name. They're grouped together. If they had different names, um, you'd be able to select them independently. See that? I changed the name to something else. They're different, and I've selected them both. So be careful. They both need the same name in order for them to be grouped together for me to select. Yes? Um, my page isn't like going past like, two pages. Like, Alright, so what I want to do here to, to make this complete is, okay, we're asking yes or no. Uh, this is where the label will come in. So let's back up before that radio button group. And here's where I'll put my label. We'll ask, would you like a free 
recipe PDF. So this label is going to be used for both of these elements. That's the question being asked. That label is being used for those inputs. So what are we missing? The name. The name. The, the attribute for, for the name below, which is recipe ask. It'll work. Uh, technically, people could completely skip the label, and it will work. But this is the right way to do it if you want to be the most correct and accessible. Uh, the label is attached to an input. Therefore, if someone has a computer you know, that will read to them, it will know that, that that text of label is attached to that input of name. So, yes? I noticed that after the yes and no input, the yes, like the word, is not inside of yeah, also it's not really inside of anything. Uh, it's just next to it, so this is being used for that also. Uh, it's just kind of grouped together, basically in the way that I've got it here as a line, but it's not actually in anything. You could put it inside of something like an emphasis tag, uh, even a paragraph, but uh, this, is, this is what we need uh, minimally for it to work. the result. Would you like a free recipe PDF? Yes or no? And you can only select one of the two. Now via JavaScript programming, we would be able to detect what did they select? Yes or no? Right now we don't have the knowledge to make that work because if they select yes, I want then something new to appear. Well, which one of our recipes? And then this will be checkboxes. We don't have that ability for it to check. So we'll assume that that works and then set up some checkboxes. After the yes or no, next line, we'll create checkboxes. Very similar to um, the radios. We know that we're going to have a label, so we might as well have it first. For recipe type, we'll say which um, which recipes. input type checkbox name to group them together recipe type value let's say um, classic So this book is going to have different, could have different styles of cookies. If they want the, the recipe book, they click yes. And we're saying, okay, which kind of recipes? Classic cookies, modern cookies, kids cookies, whatever. Um, so it's one of their possibilities that, that they can choose. I want two more possibilities. So that line, I'll just copy it and paste it two more times and change it. I want recipe types that are classic, recipe types focused on chocolate, recipe types that are party types, sure. Values, oh, uh, value, uh, classic, should, should be lowercase. I'll mention value in a moment. I haven't explained value yet. And then chocolate and party.
So again, the idea would be these don't, this section does not appear until the person selects yes. We don't have that knowledge yet, that's JavaScript. But assume that that works. They click yes, then that appears. If they click no, the re recipes never exit, never appear. Yeah? Can you create a value? Um, and you, I think I just figured it out. If you don't want to leave a space in between the two, like if you have two, a two word value, mm -hmm. like let's say chocolate chips, mm -hmm. you want to, you actually want to put them together versus actually create a space. In between. You do, yes. Value, no space. So you should put them together like we've done here. Recipe type, two words. So you just put them together with a capital letter as the second word. Okay, so value. These inputs have had a value. The only other one that we've, where we've seen value has been in the submit button. In this case, value was shown on screen, the word go. Well, value also has the purpose of uh, labeling the data in the input field that the person selects. So in JavaScript, we would later click the Go button and have it do something. It would collect that information. So I want to collect, did they select yes or no? And which of these did they select? Well, we know that now because of the value. Via the JavaScript, we'll, we will be able to check, oh, they selected the chocolate value. So that gets stored. They selected no, I don't want the recipes. So that gets stored. So value is sort of internally what do we see via the JavaScript? And we're seeing that we can select different ones. Page 157, we've got the ability to create drop-down lists, which is one selectable item out of a bunch of items. Here we're saying classic chocolate and party, and we could list 20 more types, but they're going to take up space. We have the drop-down box, which is one little bit of space taken up, and then 50 options inside of it. This is like when you're filling out a form and it asks for your state. It's going to list all 50 states, but not all 50 states in 50 lines. It's going to have one item to select and then the state inside of it. So just, uh, just to try that, we'll do this with states. So select. Label. Pick your state. For input state. As we learn more and more HTML, we'll see that there's a lot of redundancy typing things over and over, the same things over and over, often. That's why autocomplete does help eventually, after you learn the ideas, and copy and paste. So I'm doing yet another label. I could have copied the line up here, basically line 120, and pasted it and just changed a little bit. Copying and pasting definitely helps you, but you have to be aware that most likely you'll have to change some details value had to change on each of these copies and pastes. If I copied line 120 to down here, I have to remember to change the 4 and obviously the value inside. So here we've got a new one, select, which has a pair. This needs the name so that it's linked to the label. And then in between the select, the select tags, we add the possible 
options. Which has a pair. I'm not going to list them all. I'm just going to list the best ones in order. So there are templates online that you can get a list of all of the states, a little chunk of code that's already all set up for all of the states. And most likely you also want to include other US properties, you know, Guam, uh, what else is there, like the Mariana Islands and such. Uh, I often see in these boxes like a way to select Navy PO boxes and all of that. So I don't want to write all 50 states and such, so I'm just going to put a few. And each of them needs a value, again, so that the JavaScript knows how to process this. Which one did they select? Oh, they chose California, so that has a value of California. Now, what you could do to save yourself effort is you can type just the abbreviation, California. And here's an example. I'm going to type value over and over. I'm going to copy. Here's a time saver. I know I'm going to type value for each one of these. I'm going to copy the value attribute empty and paste it into each one and then just fill it in. So definitely take advantage of copy and paste. five states. Pick your state. I've got five of them ready to choose them. Uh, the problem is California selected first. Don't you often see that there is first something that says, you know, a first item that says select or something. So we would need actually one option before our main option. What's that? A placeholder. A, like a placeholder. So we'll need an option of a placeholder before selecting the first one. For California, I'll just copy and paste that. It's a lot of writing. And what I'll change is something like select and the value of no state. This is very common. You have this placeholder before selecting your real option. The problem is there, uh, not putting a placeholder automatically has something selected. And if people were to click go or save without thinking, it would automatically save something that they might not have wanted. So by having it to be select, we know that they haven't selected the wrong thing. They just didn't select anything. because then we uh, start with the label. The label seems to be a nice divider, right? 
so we would add some CSS to each label to separate things out. But we will look at an item in this chapter where we can kind of group things visually with a nice little box, and that will also separate things. That's a, uh, that's a field set that's coming up soon. Okay, so we have then a multiple select box, page 158. This one only selects you, lets you select one thing at a time. I want to be able to select multiple things, similar to the check boxes. But just kind of visually in a little bit of a different way. This multiple select box is very similar to the current drop down. It's pretty much the same code. Select option and such um, with one uh, key value. So to save ourselves some effort, let's copy all of this code. We need the label, we need the select tag. The multiple select is just about the same, but it has one little difference of an attribute. We'll change the details in a moment, but uh, just to compare, all that this needs differently is that we have the attribute. Remember, keep name as the last attribute. So back up, and we'll add this as multiple equals multiple. So the first copy, I also added a break to move it to the next line. I copied that, I pasted it right next to itself. I changed one thing, multiple equals multiple. You can start to see right here. Well, without multiple, it's a drop-down box. Looks like that. Then the other way is everything's already visible. You can see it all like that. You can also select more than one. Selected Oregon and New York. The book mentions it's a good idea to tell users if they can select more than one option at a time. It is also helpful to indicate that on a PC they should hold, hold down the control key while selecting multiple, and on a Mac they should use the command key while selecting options. So if you need a way for people to select more than one item here, we should let them know. Click control to select more than one, or click command on the Mac to select more than one. So I sort of feel personally, this one is so similar to this one, this one is obvious that you can select more than one. This one for a lot of people is not. Okay, I'm just gonna select New York, but I also want California, so you have to control click. It's not obvious to most, to many people. So we should have a note here in the label. Pick something, control click, command click. So regarding cookies and bakeries and sweets and all of that, what should we have the person select multiple of? Quantity. Uh, quantity, yeah. Let's do quantity. So here we're, we'll have our label pick a quantity. Parentheses mention control, click, or command click. We could think of a better way, but we're trying to tell them control click to select more than one, or command click to select more than one.
we need to then fill in the details, such as this label has a new for input quantity, name input quantity. Now that everything is visible, we don't actually really need that select uh, placeholder. Everything is visible at once. dozen, one dozen, I'll just do three of them, two dozen. Here, I can then very easily accidentally forget to change the values, and that's not good. Everything should have a unique value, because then when the form is processed, it won't know. Do we mean NY from here or NY from there? So those should have the unique value. So half. Does one does two does, and I can write it all completely out. Sure, but any name that you want to give these things is just fine. So I don't really find personally much use for this multiple select. I think the checkboxes is more common and it makes more sense for the person. Uh, forms are one of the most uh, annoying things either to create or for the person to use. For us to create it, we haven't gotten to the part about, well, what do we do with all that data to process it? And for the user is, I've got to fill out this and this and this. And I made a mistake here, so forms are almost never fun. Page 159 mentions an item that we won't do, uh, which is the file input box. Because again, it just needs more programming for it to fully work. We have a way for it, for the user to upload, supposedly upload something to, to us. It's a, it's a way to have them select upload and it's relatively simple to create but you can look at page 159 on your own 160 mentions the input field of submit which we've already looked at a little while ago the submit button we often have the ability uh, let's say I filled in the form but I want to start over so we do have a like a start over button a reset button Let's say after the this select this latest select field, I'll break so that it puts go in its own line, and then I'll add another input type. This time of reset value reset. In this case, value is going to display on screen. This creates a reset button, basically. Just like this is a submit button. And the purpose of that is as you fill in the form and then you want to start over. So let's say I selected this and I selected that. Click reset, unselects. Whatever you started to type will go away. Click reset, it resets. submit button, a reset button.
162 mentions uh, hidden controls. Uh, we'll skip that for the moment. That's pretty advanced. But sometimes there are elements in a form that are hidden, that are pre-set up, but the person cannot see them to select them or change them. Uh, so that would be page 162. So like if that's, let's say you have a name, and then you want to add a wife, add your wife, or your husband, or whatever, you can just click the add, and if it's there, it'll add, and then add another like, person line? You mean in terms of the hidden controls? Yeah. Not quite. Um, well, actually, yeah, I guess I guess you could do that. So the question is, if if you were going to add multiple people in a form, but you don't want the other people to appear until you've selected one person, right. uh, similar to what we already did here. Remember that I was saying, uh, would you like a free recipe? This which one? This stuff here should not have appeared until they selected yes. That's a possibility. Yeah, you can use that hidden type of input to display it until necessary. But really the purpose of it is uh, something that the user cannot see but has been set to be sent. Here's an example. I could have a contact form on the home page and a contact form on the about page. I could put a hidden field that says this was sent from the home page and one put in the contact screen that says this was sent from the contact screen. So I as the webmaster get a message with that hidden field that then tells me they filled it out on the home page as opposed to the about page. That's one possible way to use it. Question? Um, so like some websites, they don't have the option of like subscribe to our emails. So I'm assuming that they don't have that option, but then they start sending it. Is that like by default they check the box? But yeah. That could be very common as well, that they've sent you a message and suddenly you start to get emails because they might have put that hidden field that says send them an email. Sure. Okay, page uh, 163, labels. We've talked about labels, forms, or sorry, uh, grouping, ele grouping form elements, page 164. Let's look at that. This is a way for us to group elements together visually. Right now, this uh, form is just a big, long form with these different pieces. We will be able to uh, group stuff together. So let's say I want name, email grouped together. Uh, let's back up and actually ask for last name and first name in separate boxes. Then we'll add a field set to group them together. So we'll back up line 115. We're going to need basically the easiest way would be to copy and paste. Uh, oh, actually, a little lot higher right here. We're going to need to copy and paste name because I want last name and first name. And I want a box very similar to that, but instead of writing it all out manually, we'll just change the details. So for the first one, input last name. Placeholder. So I'm changing it up a little bit. The placeholder is a little different. It will only show the last name. The text vis visible, last name. It has a name, input last name, which I need to change over here too. Input last name. Now, to notice now I've got some element that has three words, input, last name. I'm still following the convention of the first word is lowercase. Subsequent words are uppercase. We should make sense what I'm trying to do for the next one. Name, input, first name. Label four, input, first name. Placeholder, Mary Jane. And visually first name between the labels.
So I still had to make a bunch of changes, but I saved my effort. I saved the effort of typing the input and the type and all of that stuff that continues. I still had to fill in the details. You have to make sure that they match. But that is supposed to get me this result a little faster. I've got last name, first name, email. You can group related form controls together inside the field set element. This is particularly helpful for longer forms. Most browsers will show the field set with a line around the edge to show how they are related. The appearance can be adjusted in CSS. Legend element can come directly after the opening field set tag and contain a caption which tells, which helps identify the purpose of the group. This is 164. So I want to group together these three lines, these three inputs basically. I want to group together last name, first name, email. That information sounds like about you information. So I'm going to group these together with a field set and a legend of about you. Back up before label, and we'll create field set. And then after email, end of field set. Maybe makes more sense a field group or an input group or an input set. They're called a field set. This is a this is an input group. After field set, we'll add legend. And in between is the text that will appear on screen. Obviously here we'll write what would make sense, but we actually want your info. There we go. So now we have a little visual representation. That stuff is related. Field set. And then the text that appears is your info. Or about you, or whatever we want to call it. With CSS, we can constrain it so that it only takes up a, an amount of space that makes sense. Obviously, I would want it you know, to be something like, like that. And if you've got your browser stretched out, it looks horrible. But mm -hmm. via CSS, we can fix that. So we should be seeing over and over that HTML is for the structure, the content, and we're keeping the CSS, uh, we're, we're waiting for the CSS to then start to style all of that. And that starts on chapter 10, which is page 227. We're closer than you think because the next chapters will go by pretty fast. So we should probably be touching CSS uh, at the latest next week. Um, and then this week, I sent out an email, hopefully you got that email, saying that we're going to wrap up the last HTML chapters this week. And then we're going to start CSS uh, next week. And then this week we're going to have a homework assignment given over the given over the weekend. Uh, remember, you've got, you're going to have Wednesday to also work on it, and then uh, the weekend, and it'll be due on Monday. So that's coming soon. In your opinion, how else can we group together stuff in this form? Yeah, exactly. So group together this free recipe, these elements. So field set, legend, and then some word that groups all of this together. I'll call this recipe book. One way, again, copy and pasting to save effort. I'm, I know I'm going to need the start of the field set, the end of the field set, and the legend. Uh, I cannot copy 
I cannot select elements that are separate from each other. Have you ever noticed that? You can only select a group of stuff next to each other. I want to select this and this. I don't think it's possible. But at the very least, I'm going to select the opening of the field set, the legend, and copy that so that it's before the recipe thing, and then end the field set. Don't forget to end the field set manually. Let's see, would you like a free recipe? I'll paste that there. And then that ends way down here before pick your state, field set. And here's an example where it might be useful to indent some things. Uh, all of this stuff is inside of this field set from here to here. So if I indented this, that'd be nice. Now, the, the thing is that you may, you may think, okay, well, that means I need to go here and tab. Don't do this yet. Go here and tab, go here and tab. Yes, you could go to each individual line and tab it, but Notepad lets you do this cool trick. If you select the lines and press tab, they all tab together. So all of them move over. If you try to do that in Word, it's going to replace everything you wrote with a tab. In a civilized code editor like this, it tabs it all. <coughs> and the funny thing is, you don't even have to have a perfect selection. Look at this. I'm going to start to select halfway through that sentence and, and, and two letters of that sentence, and that's enough for me to tab, and the whole thing tabs properly. So I use that all the time. So make selections and tab. Notepad keeps it all as a group. So for example, now I need to tab the last name, first name, and email. Just make some sort of loose selection. Press tab once, and it tabs over. Tab multiple times. I tabbed too much. You can hold Shift and Tab to tab back. Tab forward, Shift, Tab back. And that's just for aesthetics, for me and my code. I can see, OK, this chunk here is related together. It's tabbed. It's all part of the field set. Looking at page 165, we see form validation. You've probably seen forms on the web that give users messages if the form control has not been filled in correctly. This is form validation. So there used to be a very complicated way to do that with JavaScript, and now there's a built-in way with HTML5. If you look in the example code, basically there is a value of required that is added to an element so that it pops up to say, hey, you forgot to fill this in. So if you add required, it will help validate it. An example would be, well, we've, we're, we're asking for feedback. Technically, you know, if we click go, nothing happens. But if we add required to an element, it'll stop you when you try to submit. So let's say to try it for feedback. We will make the feedback field required. That's under uh, feedback, line 120. We have the attribute of required. We add this to the actual text area. So text area name, keeping name as the last one, text uh, required equals required.
So with an element set to required, if I try to click go without filling it in, please fill out this field. Automatic. In the old days, that was a lot of coding to get that to work. I'm, I'm checking this in, um, <coughs> in Firefox. It may look a little bit different in Chrome. Are you checking it in Chrome? No, I'm looking at the HTTP notepad, and it's showing black. Oh, OK, yes, I see. The attribute, you're saying, doesn't show up red. Um, notepad, for some reason, is not seeing it as an attribute. Mine is not black either. It should be red. Based on my color scheme, obviously, if I change color schemes, it's a different color. But that's normal. Notepad, I think that's a little bug in Notepad that it doesn't see the required attribute as an attribute. But if you test it, it should work. Yes? That's just an example. But if we wanted the name, no, I do want feedback. I want them to see how good I am, so I want <laughs> that to be required. But uh, maybe more logically, we could move it. I'll cut it and paste it to email. So input type email, placeholder, required, and then name. So we can add required to every element if we want, or one element. And it's required equals required to the email input, and now email is required. The rest of this chapter talks about, for example, the date input, 166, page 166. That one is a way for you to create a simple calendar where people can select a date. You can look at that one on your own. And then the next ones mention a type of email, which we did, a type of URL, a type of search, and placeholder. So you can look at the next items in the chapter, the last items in the chapter on your own, because what I want to do is a little bit of JavaScript. I want to have this form do something. Right now it doesn't do anything. If people fill this in, nothing happens. Now JavaScript, as I said before, is a 600 page book. Right now we're going to do something very easy, very simple. It's not actually going to send an email. We, we can't do that without a server. At least I want to show you that what goes into writing JavaScript and also what goes into processing a form. So we have this form. It's got various fields. I want to click Go, and I simply want it to pop up and detect your name. So we'll get to our code. What we want to do is, after the form field, the form tag, um, let's create a block called script. What will be inside of this is JavaScript. Traditionally, we have a block of JavaScript before the end of body. We've got comments at the end, so that's fine. But usually, you want JavaScript before body ends. The reason being that JavaScript can be used to collect or manipulate data in the HTML main body before or after it exists. And that's confusing to try to talk about now, but just the advice is keep your JavaScript at the end before body ends. Because JavaScript may be used to try to select an element that hasn't been created yet, meaning the web browser processes it from top to bottom. 
So if you have your JavaScript at the top, and the JavaScript says, when you click the Go button, do the following, well, it won't work because the Java the browser gets to the script at the top there is no go button at that moment it's at the bottom it's later in the code so the code crashes if we have it the way we have it here the form is created first so it exists top to bottom then the JavaScript says click the go button to do X so in the order of things it's logical it makes sense So, so what we'll do is we'll write some JavaScript and actually inside of JavaScript if you write a double slash this is a JavaScript single line comment. The comments in JavaScript are different. We don't use the HTML comment in this block. We don't use the exclamation point tag. A double slash with no space makes it a comment. There's no space between those slashes because if you put a space, it's no longer a comment and it thinks this is JavaScript. We also have this is a multi line comment in JavaScript. It's very, very similar, yeah. It's more than one line. So some of these uh, some of these conventional comments are in other languages, C and such. So we have slash asterisk, and then it's pair asterisk slash. The point of this is sometimes you need to write one quick line of a comment, so I do the double slash. And then sometimes you need to write multiple lines of comments, well, you need to do the slash asterisk. And just as a quick introduction to our, our JavaScript here, uh, we're going to have the the go button do something. You'll click go, something will happen. So we'll create what is known as a function. I'll explain this in a moment. We'll call this f and button go. Open and close parentheses. Open and close curly braces. Curly braces are shift square braces. And square braces are next to the P and the backslash on the right side of the main keyboard. Function. It's a collection of JavaScript commands. A bundle, so to speak of commands. We have a command that makes a pop-up. We have a command that will save data. We have a command that will start a timer. We have various JavaScript commands. JavaScript is all about interactivity. Remember, HTML is structure, CSS is design, JavaScript is interactivity. I want to do something. We have commands. Well, we can bundle those commands together basically in a function. We can group them. Do these seven things at once when you click the Go button. Save the data, process the data, store it in the database, play a sound, pop up a message, thank you. I want all of those things to happen at once by clicking Go. So I group them together in a function. Those groupings of commands go between the curly braces. But the syntax is, I'm going to define a function. I'm inventing a JavaScript command called fn, function, button go. And the syntax is then open parentheses, open curly braces. That's the way you define a function. But I'm going to break the curly braces into its own lines, because all the actual steps 
here. And very simply, inside of the function, for the moment, all that I want to do is use the alert JavaScript command. This one is a built-in command. We're inventing the function button go, but the alert function already exists. Again, how do I know all of the functions and possible code? You get a 600-page book that will tell them all to you, or you look them up on the web. And as I said previously, you don't need to know all the commands. I don't have that 600-page book memorized, even though I've read through it several times. I don't need to have all of the commands memorized of JavaScript or CSS or HTML, but I need to know how to look them up when I need to use them. I was doing some programming last night on an app, and I needed to look up a couple of things. I don't have it all memorized. It's OK. It's impressive to be able to regurgitate the code, uh, but it's OK to look it up. Alert, quotes, I'll just say hello. So there's a built-in JavaScript command that will make a pop-up box and alert. And it will say hello, semicolon there, end of statement. And you can say built-in JavaScript command, known technically as a method. Built-in JavaScript command for a pop-up message. In the syntax is most of the time we have a semicolon at the end of the sentence. We didn't have one on function, don't worry about it. But 99% of the time we have a semicolon at the end of a JavaScript statement or command. This is going to be pretty simple. It's just going to be popping up hello for the moment. And then it'll say hello. John Smith, whatever you type in the box. Well, in order for this to work, we need something to trigger that command. We need button go. We need to sort of link this function with the button of go. So next lines. VAR. Variable. A variable is a container, like those containers on the table over there. They hold water. But those containers can hold apple juice or cranberry juice. They can hold other liquids. Those containers there, they're variables. They hold something in the real world. In computer programming, a variable is like that, a container that can hold different things. Numbers, letters, you know, your name, your high score, variables. What I'm trying to do is, I'm in the world of JavaScript right here. And I need to connect with the world of HTML outside of the script block. So I'm creating a variable that will hold a sort of representation of the Go button so that I can use it in JavaScript. JavaScript is for JavaScript, HTML is for HTML. So I'm going to create a JavaScript variable that will sort of hold the Go button. We'll call this EL for element, BTN, Go. Equals. In most programming languages, equals is not used like 1 plus 1 equals 2. In regular math, basically you're saying the thing on the left is the same thing as the thing on the right with that equals. But in most programming languages, equals often means take the thing on the right and put it into the thing on the left. It's an assignment operator. That's the fancy way to say it. We're assigning what's on the right into what's on the left. Do you need the spaces in there? Not really. You can keep them all together like that. But it's a good idea to put the space for readability, just like we did with the HTML. Document dot. We're saying, let's go look in the main document up there. Let's go look for something to put into this container. We're going to find it by saying um, get 
element by ID. And notice the very specific spelling that you have to do right. Capital E, capital E, capital I. Common beginner error here is to put capital I, capital D. That will not work. It's got to be a lowercase d. They should have made that a capital D, because everyone thinks it's capital I, capital D. We're saying, go look in the document. Let's get an element. Let's find an element by its ID so that then we can put it inside of the JavaScript world, so to speak, and use it. Open close parentheses. Well, that looks similar here. Alert, open close parentheses. Function, button, parentheses. So you see that often. A command often has the parentheses to, to do something. Inside of the parentheses, inside of quotes, we need to specify the ID of the element of HTML that we're talking about. At the moment, it's not quite complete. The Go button doesn't have an ID, so this wouldn't quite work yet. Let's back up to the Go button. We've got type, attribute, value attribute. We need an ID attribute. That's what we're trying to do here. Let's find an HTML element by its ID. We're about to give it an ID so that the JavaScript can find it. BTN Go. This can be called anything. It can be called Kitty Cat. And it'll work as long as you use it consistently. So I, I gave a unique identifier to an element in the HTML ID, identifier. And I like to put ID, as I said before. Names, classes, and IDs, I like to put them as the last attribute of an HTML element. That's what I'm trying to get right here. Semicolon, end of statement. We can make a multi-line comment right here to explain what we're doing. Create a variable, a container with a reference to an HTML node, very fancy way of saying an HTML tag up on the HTML area. Create a variable with a reference to an HTML node, finding it by its ID attribute. what that whole line is about. This is where JavaScript is confirmed that it's the hardest thing of the three languages. HTML is easy. Uh, CSS is harder. JavaScript is hard. It's hardest and it's hard because there's a lot that could go wrong. I could easily misspell that ID and it doesn't work and I spend hours trying to figure out what did I do wrong. Oh, lowercase d. That's a syntax error. Those, are, those kinds of errors are easier to fix. We could have a logic error. I wrote the code perfectly, but I named two things BTN Go. I wrote it all correctly, but I named two things BTN Go. That's a logic error. Only one thing should have one ID. So you shouldn't be discouraged if, when you get to the JavaScript part, suddenly you make a lot, a lot of mistakes and it doesn't quite work, because it is the hardest one of the three languages. We have to sort of reach out from the script block to the rest of the page. We're in the world of the JavaScript, and we need to reach out to be able to look at and control and work with the HTML stuff, basically. So then we create a variable, a container, which is a reference to an HTML element outside of the script block, so we can use it in JavaScript. 
you can kind of think about it as a translator. It's a pointer. It's a reference to data elsewhere in the project. Question. Why do variables get held in RAM? <clears throat> they do. Uh, this is temporary. Variables are temporary. So as long as the program is running, it keeps track of it. And then when you exit the program, it goes away. We have ways, of course, to store the data more permanently. But it's all in the RAM temporarily. OK, next line. Enter a couple of times. Next line. Um, ELBTN element btn go dot add event listener capital E capital L parentheses semicolon. This is setting ourselves up for the ability to click on the button to do something in the event of a click. We're listening, we're waiting. The button in JavaScript. It's sort of been translated from HTML into JavaScript. We can refer to the button in HTML by L button go now. L button go is the JavaScript shorthand for the button up on the form. We're listening, we're waiting for an event to happen. The event is a click. We have many events. A click, a double click, a drag. We have events like when the page loads. Have you ever been to a website that you're looking at the page, you close the page, but a pop-up appears first before you leave? There's an event of on unload. When you leave a page, that's an event. It captures it, and it does something, a pop-up. You've probably seen more and more nowadays. You visit a website, and you're looking at the website, and as soon as you move your mouse out of the browser, a new pop-up appears. That one's also related to that. There's an event that is being waited for, that we're waiting for an event. And then when that event is triggered, something else happens. In the event of a click upon this button, this button is that HTML tag. All of that is to set up. Once the button is clicked, comma, run the function fn button go. The one that we invented that should give a pop up. We can sort of say here for notes, set up event listener, waiting for something, to fire on a click event, then call the fn button go function. syntax here is you do not use these opening and closing parentheses that would make sense but it's a little bit it's a little bit um, I don't want to mention why not just yet but just trust me no parentheses here we've seen parentheses almost everywhere else there's a function and such and the one that we created should have it in certain instances but for the moment no parentheses on this Give it a try. Save it and run it. Click the Go button. You should get a pop-up. Hello? Now, this is a lot of typing. Let's pause here if it didn't work, because a lot could go wrong, much more than HTML. Save it, run it. You should get the hello. If it didn't, tell me right away so that you don't have an issue. Let me zoom back into my code here. One possible mistake that you may have, remember, it's not uppercase I and D. It's just uppercase I fix our code and then we'll go on.
right, so it seemed to have mo worked for most of you right away very good. If you were having any errors, one thing that I would do is, this is, again, this is the, the, hard, the hard one. So in your web browser, we have this uh, debug console. I believe I mentioned it uh, a little bit before, but get used to this. When you start to deal with JavaScript, you load your code in the browser, and I click go, and OK, it doesn't work. Get used to, then on your web browser, pressing F12 on the keyboard to open up this console. And Chrome, it looks a little different. It's on the right. But then you get either inspector or console. You switch to console. In my case, syntax error, undetermined, un unterminated string literal. I don't know what that means. You can click learn more. It might teach you more. Or it often tells you, go check out this line. That might be the problem. I made a mistake on purpose for it to tell me the line. But this is built into all web browsers. You like Chrome, you like Firefox, Internet Explorer, Safari, they all have it, F12. On uh, Chrome, it looks a little bit different. Just to compare it, press F12. In my case, it opens on the right. And it also opens in the Elements view. Well, I want to be in the console, and I already see a little error right there. In Chrome, it looks like this console, and it's telling me uncaught syntax error, invalid or unexpected token. Different kind of error, but they're both pointing me to line 173 in my case. Chrome is saying unterminated string literal. Oh, this is nice. I click learn more, and it'll pop up to explain a little bit more what the error is. Guess what? JavaScript was invented by the people that invented Firefox in about 1994. Back then it was known as Netscape. Remember Netscape, Netscape Navigator? That was an old web browser that's kind of extinct, but it has evolved into Firefox. So the team that invented the old Netscape browser invented JavaScript, and then they went and invented Firefox. So I say that because the, the uh, error message is a little nicer in Firefox, and they also give you a little link to go read more about the problem examples Chrome it just says there's an error on 173 go check it out and so what I have to then do it doesn't tell you what I did wrong exactly and no debugger is really smart enough to tell you exactly what you did wrong just enough to say there seems to be something wrong on that line or the line above it and there might be a syntax error there oh I see I forgot to end the quote the color was wrong in Notepad. I might have noticed that. But then Firefox and Chrome are telling me there's something on that line. I saw it myself, and I fixed it. Well, this did a hello. I wanted to say hello with your name. If we're asking for a last name and first name, why not make it say hello, Victor Campos? So we can do that. Let's go back to the function, the, the, the go, function button go. Inside of function, we'll create a new variable, a new container. Let's call this val last name equals. We're creating a container that will hold the value of the last name. Okay, so then we have to do the same thing. Go find that element. Document dot get element by ID. I don't have IDs on the last name and the first name. I'll add it in a moment, which I will call in last. Or in last name. I think that's the name we have for the name. Just a moment, let me confirm that. What did we call it? Input last name. Okay, so this is basically saying take the thing on the right and put it into the thing on the left, assignment operator. Go so find an element with an ID of input last name. 
put it into the last name? Well, a couple of things here. Uh, those don't have IDs, they have names. So we need to add an ID in a moment. Also, I, I want the value. Technically here, this would grab the whole chunk of code, the whole input. I only want the value of what's been typed into that field. So one more thing at the end here, dot value, and then end of statement. Find that element, get its value, store it in the variable. So back on that input, label for input last name, input field, name, input last name, ID, input last name. There is a way to grab the data using name. It's very common, much more common to use IDs, so we'll keep it that way. We know we're also going to grab the, the, the first name. I'm about to grab the last name. I need the first name. Before I leave this area, I'm going to add an ID. Same thing here. Name of input first name, ID of input first name. Input first name. Spelling does count. Uppercase and lowercase is different to the computer. Internally, there are different character entities. So make sure uppercase and lowercase is correct. I would, yes, want to add IDs to almost everything else in the form if I really want to capture everything in it. We don't have time for that at the moment. That's the idea. Everything should have an ID so that we can capture it or see it via the JavaScript. I'll go back to the JavaScript and create a variable, another variable, to then capture the input first name. So I've created a variable. Why not copy that line and just change the details? Var first name is equal to document dot get element by ID input first name dot value. Just needed to change two things. I need to do the same thing twice. So if the person typed in what they needed to type and they click go, the JavaScript will then process this. It'll capture the values of those inputs. I'm going to make it then say hello under this alert space plus val first name space plus val last name. Plus here, in most programming languages, has a different purpose. 1 plus 1 is not the same. In math, 1 plus 1 equals 2. In most programming languages, 1 plus 1 equals 11, as we'll see why in a moment. Go ahead and run it. Remember that this requires your uh, email address, maybe for for speed, just turn off the required attribute. But let's say I will type last name, first name, victor at victor.com, and then go. Hello, Victor Campos. Remember to fill out the email, or else it'll tell you you forgot your email. And so, what happened here is I alert pop up, say hello, say the first name, say the last name, and that's what it did exactly. And this is going to remind you why computers are dumb. Don't I need a space and such? Well, I need to tell it, put spaces between these words. So I'm going to put a space right here. Hello, space. So I'm putting a space in the quotes. Hello, space. First name. I need a space between first and last name. So I have to add a space as well, like this, plus space quote space quote space plus that's putting a sent empty space 
hello space, first name, plus space, plus last name. The plus now, this is why in programming, 1 plus 1 equals 11, is because the plus symbol basically puts a sentence together. The number 1 and the number 1 put it together, 11. It's not taking it as the number 1 and the number 1. It's taking it as these elements, 1 and 1, 11. So if you run it now, click Go. Hello, Peter Parker. So it's putting in proper spaces. This is technically known as concatenation. Really fancy word to say that you're putting the block of elements together. We're at the end of our day, actually, so if it worked, great. If not, we'll do a little lab time. I'm going to save my work into the network folder and upload it to Blackboard if you want a copy of it. This is just the tip of the iceberg of JavaScript, the tip of the iceberg of forms and such. If it worked, great. If not, I'll help you in just a moment. Any general questions about what we talked about today regarding forms? OK, so that'll be it for the moment. When we come back tomorrow, we'll do a couple more chapters. Then we'll have a homework assignment, lab day, and then next week, CSS.